60 Minutes Rewind. France went to the polls today to elect a new president. There's no decision, and a runoff election must be held in two weeks to decide whether France continues the conservative policies of de Gaulle and Pompidou or moves to the left under a socialist-communist coalition. Not the most important issue that will be decided, but certainly one that will affect anyone who travels by air is the future of this airplane. Concorde, the Anglo-French supersonic challenge to American control of commercial aviation. Concorde means thousands of jobs in France and across the channel in Britain. Not only jobs, but the prestige of Britain and the glory of France are at stake as well. Concorde may just be the most extraordinarily costly joint venture two nations ever launched. For now, just as Concorde seems to have proven itself, both nations are considering scrapping the plane. A two and a half billion dollar misunderstanding. If you take away all the economics of airplane building and airline operations and look at this plane as a piece of industrial engineering and design and as a means of getting from A to B as quickly and as comfortably as possible, then Concorde sends all your 707s and jumbo jets back into the dark ages of flight, back at a rate of Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. The cabin is much the same as any conventional jet. It's a bit narrower but the seats and the fittings are covered with glove leather, so it just reeks of luxury. And it's less noisy, and there's less vibration. And the mere thought of traveling from London to New York in three and a half hours makes any amount of money they spend on these planes seem worthwhile. No question, to this traveler, Concorde is the next best thing to not having to fly at all. But take a good look while you can this plane might become the world's most expensive souvenir. For as beautiful as Concorde looks as it blazes through the sky, pushing 1,400 miles an hour, the economics of commercial aviation have made it a two and a half billion dollar white elephant, and no airline really wants it. But when Concorde was first conceived back in the late 50s, commercial aviation was a license to print money. Speed was the holy grail and Boeing was the first to provide it with a 707, cutting the transatlantic trip from 12 hours to seven. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain speaking. On behalf of the flight crew and myself, I'd like to welcome you aboard Pan American's Jet Clipper to Paris. Our flight today will take us to Le Bourget Airport. CBS sent a reporter named Bill Leonard to cover that inaugural flight. And this year, Paris and what happens there is considerably closer to us in New York because this is the year of the jet. The year that Paris is as close as Hollywood. In a jet age, Paris is no longer something to dream about. Paris is next door. And a Pan American jet clipper flew us to that door in seven hours. Today, Leonard is 16 years older. He's everybody's boss in 60 minutes. And it still takes seven hours to cross the Atlantic. So in the 50s, good planning dictated a plane that would take passengers beyond 600 miles an hour beyond the sound barrier. Military aircraft had done it, but for commercial aviation, carrying 100 passengers or more economically, a whole new technology had to be created. So with great certainty, Britain and France in 1962 signed an elaborate document pooling their resources to design and build a plane to fly twice the speed of sound, a plane that would break the American hold on commercial aviation. The contract was lodged with the international court and provided no get-out. Neither country could withdraw for technical or financial reasons. It was also the price of Britain's entry into the common market. And so, Concorde was born. In Bristol, England, they were to build the engine, tail, and nose. And in Toulouse, France, the wings and fuselage. It was to become the most tested and the most expensive commercial airplane ever built. 
There were a lot of bad jokes about two such different peoples combining on such a sophisticated project, like the camel really being a horse designed by a committee. And some called Concord Operation Discord. Nevertheless, the builders of the plane made good progress. In the 60s, there was the assumption that we'd all be flying supersonically by now. The American aircraft industry, late to the game, feared a serious challenge to its domination of the commercial aircraft business. President Kennedy authorized $750 million for an American SST, a bigger and faster plane than Concorde. It is my judgment that this government should immediately commence a new program in partnership with private industry to develop at the earliest practical date the prototype of a commercially successful supersonic transport superior to that being built in any other country of the world. After eight years and almost a billion dollars and not much more than a mock-up, the project was dropped killed by a powerful environmentalist lobby and the vivid memory of enormous cost overruns on military aircraft. There was a temptation to drop Concorde as well, but the Anglo-French plane was far advanced, and there was a question of the Russians. Two months before Concorde's maiden flight, they flew the Tu-144. It was immediately dubbed Concordski and there was good reason for the striking similarity between the two planes. An espionage ring working in Toulouse had been supplying the Soviets with streams of information on the Concorde's testbed performance. Two Soviet agents were finally taken off the Ostend to Warsaw Express with toothpaste tubes full of microfilm. Five years later, the Russians paid dearly for their rush into the commercial SST stakes. At the Paris Air Show, at subsonic speed, an overzealous Soviet pilot lost control. But foreigners were the least of the threat. The cost of the plane was soaring, from half a billion to a billion dollars, and still climbing. But unless both countries agreed to cancel, neither could. So Discord was saving Concord. Next, the environmentalists not as powerful in Britain as the U.S., and perhaps a bit extravagant in their fears. England's green and pleasant land would be devastated. Seagull eggs and airline stewardesses would become sterile. And the ancient and glorious cathedrals of England would first lose their magnificent stained glass windows, and then would all tumble down as a result of sonic boom. Every eccentric got into the act, complaining that cats had gone mad from Concorde, this days before the plane even flew. And sound engineers found before Concorde's flight that their meters had gone haywire. The bass notes of the great organs at Evensong were much more powerful than Concorde's sonic boom. But the builders heeded the pollution problems and managed to reduce emissions and airport takeoff noise to those of a Boeing 707. And it was agreed that she would not break the sound barrier over populated land. But Concorde was not to be the next great leap in commercial aviation. It was this, the wide-bodied conventional jet, the jumbo. Upstairs, downstairs, they could carry 400 people great distances. Still less than 600 miles per hour, but great economy for the airlines. Cheap to operate. And compared with Concorde's maximum payload of 120 passengers, a bargain price. $28 million each against Concorde's projected $50 million. But against that, Concorde would cross the Atlantic four times a day, a jumbo jet only twice. The airlines staked their future on the jumbo. But the jumbos provided more seats than passengers. Cheap charter fares stole millions from the scheduled airlines. And the American carriers, Concorde's biggest potential customers, went deeper into the red. The British and French launched a massive sales campaign for the plane, sending it round the world, showing the flag. Showing that this was no mere peek into the future, but a viable passenger aircraft that moves at roughly the speed of a bullet. They claimed that in spite of its drawbacks, limited capacity and range, 
huge fuel consumption that once fully operational, no airline could afford to be without it, at least for first-class travel on lucrative routes. But the money men in the airline said no. First, Air Canada, and then by the dozens, airlines let their options lapse. The worst blow came when Pan American and TWA, within an hour of each other, canceled their order for 13 Concords. Leaving two possible orders by Iran, which can afford anything, three for China, for a projected Peking to New York service, and only nine firm orders for Air France and British Airways, both extensions of their own governments. A two and a half billion dollar misunderstanding of the economics of commercial flying. And France and Britain, both with new governments, ponder the chilling statistics that show that at $50 million a copy, the more planes they build, the more money they lose. To show a profit, they must raise the price, and orders for hundreds of planes must be renewed. The story will continue after this. Bernard Darieux is director of sales for Aerospatiale, the French builders. What went wrong? Why did they all fall away like autumn leaves? To a large extent, I think this is due to the economic situation in the uh, airline industry. After the uh, subsonic jets were first put into operation, the airlines made money in the early 1960s, and this is exactly when they took options on Concorde and the US SSC. But after the introduction of the wide-body jets in the late 60s, early 70s, then uh, they all uh, lost money. It is just a sad fact of life that they have overcapacity. They don't see their way clear into the future as to where traffic will grow or will not grow, uh, the uncertainty on fuel costs, etc. So I think they take an attitude of wait and see. But at Toulouse and Bristol, you do not sense any doubts about Concorde. They are at various phases of production on 16 of the planes, including five already flying. Clearly the most tested airplane ever built, perhaps over-tested, for if Concorde had come along five years ago, we'd be flying it today, and there'd be plans for airplanes three times faster than sound. Whatever the mistakes of economic calculation, the big white bird, as the French call her, is a sight to behold. Pilots say if a plane looks right, it is right, and Concorde certainly qualifies. Almost a life of its own, more an act of natural creation than space age technology. But as smoothly as she slips along, 12 miles high, above all the weather and all the wind, her survival depends not on performance, but on sales. Even the state-owned British Airways, committed to five Concords, has doubts about her future. The chairman is David Nicholson. The problem with uh, Concord, which we have always recognized, is that it is extremely difficult to forecast what the operating economics are going to be. We don't know even now where we're going to be allowed to land, where we're going to be allowed to fly over. This is a totally new concept in uh, aviation. You're flying supersonically with a skin temperature of uh, 126 degrees centigrade. We don't know what the working life of the machine will be. We don't know how much to allow uh, definitely for maintenance and downtime. Now, with all these uh, variable factors, it is extremely difficult to forecast what the operating results will be. What are you saying? junk Concorde rather than take the financial risk of flying it? No, indeed I'm not saying that. I believe we should go ahead and fly Concorde and we in British Airways want to do this. Now, uh, two years ago we were perfectly prepared to take the development risk without concern and we reckoned that even if things worked out badly with Concorde we could still make a hundred million pounds profit per annum. That situation has been radically changed because of the worldwide fuel crisis. Therefore, the gamble which today we would uh, be taking would be a much greater one from our point of view. Concord or no Concord, are we not going to be flying supersonic sooner or later anyway? I believe so. 
I believe, sir, the advantages uh, are so great. And uh, from what I have heard, the technology has advanced to the point where a Concorde Mark II or even a Concorde Mark III is possible and would have new uh, performance possibilities which would radically change its attraction to airlines. If the worst happens to Concorde, if they pull in the acetylene torches and cut them all up for scrap tomorrow, it will be a tragedy of sorts. Every machine, starting with the wheel, is not so many nuts and bolts. It's the fruit of man's collective genius, that urge that may result in a great symphony, or a great tapestry, or even a great aeroplane. To deny it is to deny one of the few positive instincts our rather pitiful species can claim. That curiosity that makes us seek out the unknown and conquer it. Concord or no Concord, it is clear we will be flying supersonically sooner or later. Last week, the Russians let it be known that 200 TU-144s, the so-called Concordskis, were in production.